Well, good morning. Welcome to Zion Online. We're so glad you're worshiping with us. Um, my name is John Hopple, and I'm the music director here at Zion. And it's my privilege, and it's a blessing to get to worship with you and to um, come before you today. Um, and uh, I'm really excited, and it's my pleasure to round out the year with you. And what a year it is, my goodness. I thought 2020 would never end, right? It seems like it just keeps going on and on and on. It just feels like a never ending roller coaster that we're on, just plummeting 90 degrees straight down with only every so often little bumps back up and down before we just keep plummeting down to the bottom. 2020 feels like a long, incredibly over the top, incredibly boring infomercial. And we just have to sit through it and watch it for hours and hours and hours. And every five seconds, the host comes back on to say, but wait, there's more. <sighs> yes, thank you. There's always more with this year, it seems. And we just want to shut off the TV. We want to unplug the computer, the laptop, the, the smartphone, and shut this ad off. But we can't. 2020 just seems to be going on and on and on. And Frankly, it's been somewhat of an inconvenient year. If, you're at all, if your experiences are all at all like mine, I know that uh, 2020 is a year of canceled vacations, canceled weddings, canceled get-togethers, canceled funerals. Um, personally, my, uh, my brother got married this year. And for a while, in and amidst the typical planning that goes on, um, dresses and and suits and decorations and the venue. In and amongst that was the little question in the back of everyone's mind, are we even gonna to get to do it? Are we even gonna have this wedding? And thankfully, the answer was yes, but it was an interesting one. It was somewhat of an inconvenient one, but in the end, it was beautiful. Because if you had rolled up to the reception, you would have seen a sight that was crazy. The whole parking lot, people spread out, little familial clusters, six feet apart, just watching and waiting for the bride and groom. And it was certainly not something that I would have seen coming. And I'm sure that 2020 was a year that not a lot of us saw coming because it was inconvenient. It was different. But that's what I wanna focus on a little bit today it's how these inconveniences, the, the hiccups, the bumps in life, some of them small, minuscule even, but others that can be pretty drastic, how all of these inconveniences are kind of just a part of what it means to follow Jesus. So I want to get into it. I want to start by talking about a little bit of what inconvenience actually means. Um, the dictionary definition of inconvenience defines it as trouble or difficulty caused to one's personal requirements or comfort. Now, as I was reading that, it, it kind of stuck out to me as I was thinking and praying on, on what to say. And yeah, that seems like 2020 in a nutshell. Trouble or difficulty caused to one's personal requirements or comfort. And I want to look at a little passage from the book of Luke. If you have your Bibles, um, if you have hand Bibles, physical copies, I know that's kind of an old concept in today's age, but if you flip, crack open the Bible in the half and flip to the, the right, you'll find the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and finally Luke. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62, we get to see some of the inconveniences that Jesus himself lays out on what it means to follow him. If you follow along with me, Luke 9, 57, as they, the disciples and Jesus, were walking along the road, a man came up to Jesus and said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. 
Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. This passage highlights three men who came up to Jesus or Jesus coming up to them with an invitation, with a request to follow Jesus. And at first glance, it seems like Jesus' answers were way more blunt than I would have anticipated, way more matter of fact. And I imagine the disciples were clustered around questioning, Jesus, are you sure you want to say that? Are you, you know we want people to follow us, right? Jesus highlights with pretty stark honesty what it means to follow him and what we're going to experience. And I want to highlight three inconveniences that Jesus points out that we experience every day, especially this year. The first guy that comes up to Jesus, he does so in the most ostentatious way. Boldly, I can imagine he's walking up, Jesus and the disciples are going through towns. There's people watching from the village houses, whispering to themselves, hey, did you see that's Jesus? Hey, I heard he fed 5,000 people. Hey, I heard that he turned water into wine. Hey, I heard, and there's just people going, whispering, whispering. And this guy gets the idea, I wanna go up to Jesus. I want to follow this guy, and I want to make sure that he knows it. He's walking up, chest puffed out, and he says, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Wherever you go. Jesus' response isn't my response. It probably isn't a lot of people's responses. I would have said something like, wow, great, I, I could really use that passion. Jesus' response is a little different. Foxes have dens, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, you want to come with me? You want to go anywhere I go? I don't have a home to go to. I'm on the road. We're going to go to places that you might not expect. That first inconvenience is when we choose to follow God, when we choose to follow after Jesus, He'll lead us to places we just didn't plan on. I wonder if you've ever prayed a prayer like I have. Lord, I will do whatever you want. Just tell me what it is. Lord, I'll go with you wherever you go. Just tell me where. I've prayed prayers like that, asking God for guidance, saying I'm on board with following Jesus. If only he'd reveal the path to me. The thing is, if we ask Jesus for that prayer, be careful. If you've asked that prayer of Jesus, be careful because he'll answer it. You just might not like the answer. There are a lot of places that we go in life, a lot of stops along the way, and not all of them are planned that way. See, when we choose to follow after Jesus, He's going to go places that we weren't expecting. Sure, there's going to be mountaintop experiences. There's going to be transfigurations. There's going to be feeding the 5,000 moments. Absolutely. But there's also going to be the cross. There's also going to be those moments that are really hard. And we would say to Jesus, well, I'll follow you pretty much anywhere, but not there. Can we not go there? That, I don't want to go there. That, does, that wasn't in the plan, Jesus. That first inconvenience, Jesus will lead us to places that we just didn't plan on. The second guy, in quite the contrast to the first, doesn't start the conversation. Jesus actually goes up to this man and says, hey, follow me. And this time he replies, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, dude, I didn't even realize I was in the middle of a funeral here. Sorry, I did not mean to interrupt. Please go on your way. Well, he says he wants to bury his father, but what that means is, more likely, Lord, let me take care of my father and my mother. Let me be a son to them. Lord, let me help out with the family business. Let me take care of all my assets on this side. And then when I don't have that to worry about anymore, when I'm free of those obligations, then I'll follow you. 
And what does Jesus respond with? Let the dead bury their own dead. Yikes. That's pretty to the point, isn't it? Jesus is saying to this man and to us, look, if you want to follow after me, the other commitments you have, we have to leave those aside. Oftentimes when we make decisions, when we have a choice in front of us, it's not a choice between a good decision and a bad decision. We're pretty okay at determining obviously good things versus obviously bad things. No, sometimes when we make choices, it's between something good and something good. Lord, where am I going to go to school? I have these two colleges in mind. I'm not really sure. What's your path? Lord, I, I could go into business. I could go into full-time ministry. What's the path? What do I do here? Sometimes we have these good decisions. But when we choose to follow after God, when we make the effort to learn what it is that he has for us, when we go to these places we weren't expecting, we learn that following Jesus can be uncomfortable. It means saying no to a lot of really good things. It means saying no to sometimes friends or family. It means saying no. It means saying no. There's a, a show that I've uh, taken to watching that's really fantastic called The Chosen. And if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. Um, they have their own app on the App Store that you can watch on your tablet or your smartphone. And the show details Jesus and his ministry. But it does so much more than that because it gets to sh you get to see the lives of the disciples, the context in which they lived. We get to see Peter and Andrew, James and John, as they live their lives as fishermen, what that means, what they struggle with. We get to see Jesus, yes, uh, perform miracles, but we get to see some of the people he interacted with and how they formed those relationships. And we also get to see Nicodemus. In the Bible, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a rabbi, a teacher, and he was also a member of the Sanhedrin, a high up religious organization. They were the ones that pretty much were the religious authority back in Jesus' day. If you had a question about scripture or theology or God, they were the ones that you ought to talk to. And yet, throughout the show, we see Nicodemus wrestle with, what does it mean to follow God? I feel like something's missing. And when he finally sees Jesus doing miracles, he finally gets to be on the receiving end of the miracles, he, he has to know. He has to know Jesus. He goes and he tries to figure out where he is and who can I talk to to meet with Jesus? And I have to know what's going on until eventually we see Nicodemus meet with Jesus on a rooftop at night. This scene is illustrated in your Bible. If you want to read the full scene, you can go to John chapter three in the New Testament and see Jesus talk with Nicodemus about what it means to follow him. And that's where we get the famous passage that we all know so well. John 3, 16, Jesus says to Nicodemus, this is why I'm here. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, will not die, but have eternal life. And Nicodemus sits there awestruck. He just, he can't believe it. I think some of the quotes from the show is uh, Nicodemus just saying, I've seen you perform miracles that I would never even have dreamed of. I, I could never do. I've seen so many amazing things. I, I don't even know what to think. And Jesus simply offers his hand and says, follow me and you'll see greater things than that. Ultimately, at the end of the first season, we see Jesus and the disciples gathered around. They're ready to leave. Jesus is going on the road. Got people to see, ministry to do. And Nicodemus is nowhere to be found. Oh, he wants to go. Believe me, he wants to go. But he's a Pharisee. He's got his own disciples. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. He can't just go traipsing across the countryside. 
He's got children and grandchildren. He's got so many responsibilities. It would be uncomfortable to leave all that behind to go with a man he barely knows. But that's the choice that Jesus is offering him. And it's the choice that Jesus is offering us. If we want to say yes to Jesus, it might be uncomfortable. It might look a little bizarre. And yes, it might be inconvenient. The third man that Jesus meets in this little passage says to Jesus, I will follow, Lord. I will. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Yeah, sure. What's, what's the problem with that? I mean, you, sure, you want to say goodbye before you head out on a long journey, I would imagine, right? Well, Jesus says this to him. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Puts a hand to the plow and looks back. What do you mean? Well, in those days when you were plowing a field, getting ready for springtime, you had to make sure that you plowed straight rows to plant your crops. And of course, the machinery was not as good as we have today. You had to take a huge heavy plow and dig straight rows in order to make sure that the crops came in just the way that you wanted them. But if someone was plowing and friends came along the road and you turned back and you said to them, oh, hey, how's it going? Oh, hey, Bill, Ted, hey, how you doing? Yeah, just plowing some crops, don't worry about, oh, no! You get wavy lines and your straight lines start to curve and now you have a big problem. Jesus is saying, if you want to follow after me, you got to focus in. You got to keep your eyes on the prize. You got to go after me and you can't be distracted. I don't know about you, but I get distracted a lot. Some of us get distracted by material things. Um, we get distracted by money. We get distracted by attention that people lavish on us. We get distracted by friends. We get distracted by family. We get distracted by our Christmas decorations. If Jesus if we want to follow after Jesus, we have to lay our distractions aside. Some of us don't get distracted by material things per se. No, we get distracted by what others are doing. If we're running hard after Jesus, as it says in Hebrews 12, if we're running our race after Jesus, having our eyes fixed on what Jesus is doing ahead of us, it's really easy to turn and look to either side, the lanes next to us, and see people running alongside of us. Sometimes it seems like they're running out way ahead of us. It seems like we're lagging behind. When we get distracted by what others are doing, we lose sight and we can get discouraged on what Jesus is calling us to do right here, right now. No, what he's calling you to do doesn't look like what he's calling everyone else to do. It's going to look a little different. And that's okay. All that matters is we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Following Jesus costs something. It costs us leaving aside these material things. It costs us leaving aside our worries about what other people are doing or where other people are. Following Jesus ultimately is inconvenient because it always comes with a price tag. Now, being inconvenienced is no fun. I'm not going to stand up here and say that it is. But, following, but being inconvenienced, following Jesus, it's a chance to experience true service. There's one last, um, one last story that I want to leave you with. And it's a story that I'm sure you're familiar with. I'm sure you've heard it a dozen times. But if you haven't, it's the story of the Good Samaritan. And you can find it and read it in its entirety just a chapter later in Luke 10, verses 25 through 37. And I'll paraphrase it a little bit. But basically, a teacher of the law, a Pharisee, most likely, asked Jesus in order to test him. He said, Jesus, what is, how, do I inter, how do I get eternal life? You keep talking about eternal life. How do I get it? And Jesus says, well, tell me the commandments. What is the commandments? What do you know? 
And the man says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, nailed it. You got it. Do this and you will live. And the man says, well, hang, hang on, hold on, hold on. Who's my neighbor though? Who, who am I supposed to love like myself? And Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, how when a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho, he was attacked by robbers, beaten half to death and left on the side of the road. And not one, but two religious leaders, high religious leaders in the day, a priest and a Levite walked along the road, saw the man in pain and in need and said, nope, and walked on the way. But a Samaritan, a Samaritan, a person who was hated by the Jewish people, enemies of the Jewish people, stopped, bent down, bandaged his wounds, put him on his donkey and took him to a nearby inn and said to the innkeeper, here's what I owe you. I'm going on my way, but I'm coming back this way. And if there's any other expense that you need from me, I will pay it. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. I wonder what that Samaritan must have thought other than, oh my gosh, I have to help. I wonder if there was a moment where he paused and said, oh, this is a Jewish man. I wonder if it's going to, I wonder if, what the people are going to think if I stop and help. I wonder if he thought, gosh, I really have somewhere to be. I got to get to Jericho by sundown. If I stop and help this guy, I won't make it. It probably wasn't very convenient. And it probably wasn't the first choice. But what came out of that? Mercy, grace, and kindness, true service, what Jesus calls me to, and what Jesus calls you to. A true act of service, a true act of love isn't always convenient. No. God doesn't call us to be comfortable. He calls us to be confident, both in his power and in his promises. What are some of those promises? I will never leave you, God says, nor forsake you. I will be with you to the very end of the age. In this world, you will have trouble. Oh yeah, we'll have more years like 2020, I'm sure. I pray that 2021 is better than 2020, but I can't guarantee it. In this world, you will have trouble. You will have inconvenience and you will have heartache. But take heart. Jesus has overcome the world. So when we serve out of our inconveniences, when we, when we have moments where we think to ourselves, oh, it's really hard to give right now. God, can you come back in a couple months? I'll be ready then. God, oh, I'd really love to go on a mission trip, but not now. I've got school. I can't just leave. God, I've got this successful job. You really want me to go into ministry full time? Are you sure? Can't you just come back later? When we have those moments. I hope and I pray that you, like me, will answer the call that God has placed on our lives, whether it's convenient or not. And in those moments, when we live out our lives in service to Jesus and in service to others, we finally stand before God in heaven. We hear the greatest promise from the greatest promise keeper. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and enter into the joy of your master. Would you pray with me? Father God, this year has been tough to say the least. But God, you were a part of it. You were always with us. You were always going before us, beside us, and behind us. And God, no matter what the new year looks like, no matter what the future looks like, I pray that you continue to walk with us, continue to guide us, and show us exactly what it is that you have for each and every one of us. And I pray that you give each and every one of us the strength of your Holy Spirit that we can answer the call, that when those moments come up that we really just want to get angry, we really just want to be frustrated, that we're inconvenienced, and that life isn't going the way we want it to, I pray that we reach out to you instead. 
I pray that we call upon you instead. And I pray that we love wholeheartedly in the middle of the times where it's convenient and the times where it's not. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.